um, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is William Lechuga and I am the uh, launch base director uh, of, uh, uh, of You Construct Society here in Whitefort City. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, LaunchBase is the entrepreneurship and business services arm of UConstruct. Uh, we run a 12-week startup bootcamp uh, program twice a year uh, here in Whitehorse, uh, an entrepreneur speaker series, and lunch and learns like this. Uh, this particular lunch and learn series is um, has the um, a, a bit of a tweak to. Uh, uh, to adapt and to, um, and to integrate that new reality of COVID-19. Um, and uh, it's broken into um, um, categories or themes. Uh, last month, uh, we had the opportunity to have uh, Neil Fletcher join us to uh, speak about marketing and branding in two sessions, an introductory session and a more hands-on session, a part one and a part two. Um, in a similar fashion, this month, we're going to be discussing sales uh it's uh, broken into four different topics two of which uh will be presented today uh and uh in another two uh in about two weeks time um there will be a survey sent out at the end of this webinar uh, but if you do have any ideas um about future topics or anything else that you'd like to ask uh, or are curious about any of the programming or any of the other things that we do uh, please send an email to info at uconstruct.com or contact us on social media. Um, this webinar, as I said, is being recorded. Uh, if you like your questions to remain anonymous, please use the Q&A section uh, option there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there is a, uh, a box that you can tick uh, that allows you to ask anonymous questions. And if you're okay with everyone uh, reading your question and knowing who you are, uh, then, uh, then unclick that uh, and untick that that, that that box and uh, and ask away. Uh, the format for this uh, webinar is a thirty-minute presentation uh, followed by a fifteen-minute Q and A, uh, and 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 a thirty-minute presentation after that, followed for, followed by an additional fifteen-minute Q and A. If you have questions, and I'm sure you will, please write down your questions as they uh, as they uh, come. And, uh, and just ask right away on that Q&A um, uh, section of the, of the webinar. And when the time comes, I will read the question out loud to, to Steve. And Steve will have the opportunity to, to answer that question. We only have 15 minutes for each one of the, for each one of the sections. Uh, so, you know, uh, be brief, but please ask away. Uh, the, the, we will learn a lot during, that, during the Q&A uh, section. So uh, I, encourage, I encourage your questions. Uh, Sales and Core uh, Inc. Uh, was founded by uh, Steve Traplin, a former tech CEO, co-founder, and seasoned executive with over 45 years of experience. The past 20, providing high-value consultant services uh, to tech company founders, CEOs, and their sales teams. Steve co-founder provided overall leadership and directly managed the team, the sales and marketing efforts for several technology companies where aggressive execution and adherence to sales methodology and process resulted in highly profitable acquisitions and substantial return to stakeholders. Recognizing that many of his fellow technology entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs like direct sales experience, Steve founded Sales Encore and helped to help them better understand and manage their, this critical function. And in this capacity, as a leader and lover of sales, we invited Steve, who joins us from Ottawa, for more information about Sales and Core, please go to www.salesandcore.com. Steve, welcome. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, William. And uh, welcome to everyone. I'll just uh, get my screen and we'll get underway. First and foremost, I hope everyone on the, uh, on the call is safe and practicing all your social distancing. Um, still waiting for the screen, William. Just allow me and there you go. Thank you. Great. Everyone okay with seeing the screen? William, if you can see it, I'm, yes. sure I'm, I'm banking yes. on everyone else able to do it. Yes, we do. Well, this is a 100-pound subject, and I'm going to try to stuff it into a one-pound time bag. So we'll, we'll just get underway. 
And uh, this is a this is a subject that is very near and dear to my heart because it's uh, it's the one subject in the corporate mix that, in my opinion, uh, decides the fate of your company and the fate of your vision and your dreams. So I'm going to just get underway, and um, I think this is uh, this is a quote that I firmly believe in. You can have the best product, you can have the best service in the world, and frankly, until you sell it, it's just theory. And so I'm a, I'm a big believer in taking plans uh, that you've uh, no doubt been de developing uh, in your boot camp if you're part of the cohort or in independent um, uh, processes that um, you know develop the high level plan and drop it down now into rubber meeting the road. Now we've got to execute. Now we've got to actually make the sales calls and, and get out there. And why is this important for entrepreneurs? I thought I would start with this, even though it may be manifestly obvious. First and foremost, trying to get money uh, in terms of financing today, whether from angel investors or VCs or from friends and family, it's hard. And the only other way to get money is to get it through sales. And if you've developed a plan, if you're launching your company, there is nothing that validates that planning as effectively as getting sales. If you ever watch Dragon Den or Shark Tank, that within minutes, they're asking the question, how much have you sold? Because to them, that's the ultimate acid test of all the goodness that you've shared with them, all the market plans, all the Save the Whale campaigns, it ultimately boils down to, have you sold anything? If you can quickly grow your company on the sales front, you get the advantage of becoming a market leader. And when you're a market leader, you get all kinds of advantages bestowed upon you because the natural selection process of buyers is to look for the safest option. And quite often, they will just default to the leader position. And here's my favorite, and I found this out the hard way. I've had companies that were virtually bankrupt at the time that I started them, and I've had other companies that were shoveling money into the bank. And I gotta tell you, I like the second one better because everything about managing a company gets easier when you've got good cash flow. But my favorite reason, and perhaps the one that I want to uh, project upon this group, is if you've got a vision, if you've got a dream, you've got something in your mind that you want to develop as a, uh, a co-founder or a CEO or an entrepreneur, there is nothing going to make that happen and pay back your investors if you've had to borrow money and to give yourself an opportunity to change your life dramatically than getting out and making some sales. But let's just address the elephant in the room when it comes to sales, and that's COVID-19. March, the lockdown, uh, the continued um, onslaught of businesses, uh, you know, suffering, collapsing, uh, this is very, very real. And to the extent that I can, in the short time that we have, I'm gonna to try to fold some of that in. And here's again, one of my favorite expressions. You know, we all had plans back in March, and then those plans got completely uh, slapped. And uh, to what degree, depends on the markets you're in, depends on the industry that you're in. For some people, it was a complete shutdown. For other people, I've got uh, clients who are in incredibly uh, strong upgrowth because this just happened to play into some of the uh, uh, technologies that they had for supporting the shelter at home. And I'm an optimist, and I think all entrepreneurs are optimists, otherwise you're in the wrong business. And there's no question, despite the COVID-19 impact, people are still buying and people are still selling. And one of the distinct advantages if you're selling products or services nowadays is the buyers are on the same footing as you are. They're also trying to adjust. They're also trying to figure out what the strategy is. And I've had lots of people ask me, is it immoral? Is it proper to go out and try to sell under these conditions? And I say, absolutely get out and sell, especially if you've got something that can help them manage this uncertainty, get out there and sell them. You, you owe that to them. Uh, but it takes a lot more than a, an upbeat attitude. And that's what we're going to start looking into. Good selling starts with your marketing plan. And this is why I think it's a great segue, uh, you know, from what uh, William was talking about in terms of the boot camp and the progression is that the marketing was the previous subject. And, you know, marketing success 
uh, is built around what, what's termed the customer theory. What do you know about the customer? Uh, what do you understand about the customer's buying habits and practices and behavior? And the one thing that COVID-19 has done is it's completely upset that apple cart. What you thought you knew before, even as, as recently as March and April, that plan needs to be reassessed because you may not have the correct assumptions anymore for bringing your product or service out to the marketplace. And you have to continually reassess. There's something in marketing that's called the history effect, which is the effect of a, of a, va a variable over time. And the variable in this case is COVID-19. Uh, I'm sure you can vividly recall when, when uh, the lockdown started, uh, news was coming at you hourly. It wasn't monthly or quarterly, it was hourly. And, and so whatever plans that you're uh, putting in place and you're revising, they've gotta be revised on a, on a regular basis because good selling is just good marketing, well executed. Right? So it all starts with that marketing plan. And if you've done the traditional target market segmentation, where you're looking for the ideal customer and, and then a peripheral uh, group of customers that are reasonably close to your sweet spot and then perhaps some customers that you will sell opportunistically. After COVID-19 hit, you might need to revisit that market segmentation and apply what I call a crisis segmentation layer, which is look at the businesses and the markets and the sectors and the countries that you were marketing and selling to and ask yourself, are they thriving? Are they surviving? Or are they victims of COVID-19? If you were selling tablecloths to restaurants, you were probably gonna have a pretty tough go of it. But there are businesses that are thriving and, and uh, businesses that are just uh, holding on. Anything that you knew before the crisis, you need to reassess and determine if those marketing assumptions are still valid. Otherwise, you're setting your sales engines off on the wrong uh, destination. So let's jump into that first session now that we've set the table with the COVID-19 impact at a very high level. What I'm gonna talk about here very quickly is just what is in a sales plan. Now, for some of you, this may be very, very uh, straightforward. For others, uh, it may be uh, very new. Uh, I want to talk about what makes selling so hard in the first place. I and mean, why, why don't we just simply go out and sell? And, and I'm going to reveal a little bit of the seller and buyer personas. And some of the information that I'm talking about here today is going to set up some of the future sessions that are coming as well. I want to share with you um, the experiences that I've had with successful salespeople. What do successful salespeople do, both in planning and execution, that makes them consistently exceed their, their targets? And then we'll look at some of the, uh, the ways in which uh, sales can be managed and measured on the way. So, simplistically, what's in a sales plan? Well, if, if this was your business and marketing plan, this is your sales plan. This is a breakdown in detail of all the programs, sales related, they're gonna help you execute on the grand scheme. And that means when you're putting your sales plan together, you must make sure that it's connected directly to whatever your marketing objectives were, whatever your key business plan. Everyone has a business plan that has revenue goals, compounded annual growth goals, <clears throat> profitability and sales mix goals. Those have to now be carried down to the next level. It's no different than a budgeting process where you have a high level department budget and now you have to break it down into the individual line items. Sales is no different. In fact, sales planning is pretty straightforward. You just take the high level plan, break it into all the little plans. You look at how are we going to compete? How are we going to win? How are we going to uh, project our revenue across the product mix? And, and are we gonna sell it ourselves? Are we gonna use retail uh, resellers? Uh, and then how are we gonna make the calls? And I haven't the time, and this isn't the, the, this, uh, the vehicle for teaching you how to make a sales plan. I just wanna make sure that I put out there that the sales plan must directly add up to the business plan. All of the components of that sales plan must make the business plan. You can't have any disconnects. Otherwise, um, you know, even if you execute your sales plan flawlessly, you're not achieving your corporate objectives. So that's the easy stuff. Planning is easy. 
Doing is the hard stuff, right? The, 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 uh, the hard stuff is not in the knowing, it's in the doing. So I can put together a plan, but what, what is it that makes selling so hard? Well, very few products or services I've ever run into, and I've done a broad range of them, are actual game changers that you hear at once and you go, oh my God, I have to have it. Very few products are game changers. And very few, despite what we feel as entrepreneurs, uh, very few of them just go out and sell themselves. You have to go and sell them. And what we think is valuable and what we think makes our product and service really awesome isn't always obvious to the buyer. And the real reason, and I'm gonna work on this as the series unfolds, the real reasons customers buy has a very, very uh, uh, small footprint in what your product actually is. It's much more into some factors that are completely overlooked in a lot of sales pitches and a lot of sales plans. And I'll just leave that out as a teaser for now. And then there's this factor. And I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs over the years in startup companies from one person organizations to large organizations. There's this fear, there's this concern and this stigma associated with sales as uh, something that um, I would just rather not do. And so I will hire in salespeople and I'll let them do the selling for me. I'll tell you, as a CEO and a former uh, founder of several companies, the reason I had to master sales was because I had salespeople that continually let me down. And I didn't understand sales well enough to know how to figure out why and to what to do about it. So that's the reason my practice is built around sales. So let me put out a sales challenge uh, for everyone here. What if what you were selling was identical in every respect to the competition. Same price, same features, same discount and incentives, absolutely the same quality, same guarantees, same warranties, and you had numerous competitors in your same city or region. I would think that if I polled, that uh, would this make for a difficult sale? I'd probably get a lot of yeses on this. And yet, a car salesperson does that every day. They're on a Chrysler car lot at one end of the city and there's a, a Chrysler car lot on the other end of the city and they got exactly the same things to sell. And even more, they can sell each other's products off of each other's lots. And they do that every day. And yet, nobody wants to be confused with being a car salesperson. And the reason I'm bringing this into the sales planning is this, this gets to the heart of how you're going to organize yourself to sell and go beyond the, the, the knee-jerk approach of just telling people about your features, advantages, and benefits. And how many of you who have children looked into the nursery or have friends who've had children, you've come to the nursery board and you said, oh, I hope my baby grows up to be a salesperson. You know, that to me is just the ultimate. Uh, I don't think that actually gets, that gets said a lot uh, in the early stages. And, and what is it that causes this stigma? Well, I'm going to just push out all of the terms that I hear over and over again. What are salespeople regarded as aggressive, pushy, they don't listen, they know everything, they're know-it-alls, they can't trust them. It goes on and on and on. If you're going to execute well in sales, you have to, I think, accept that whether deserved or not, in many respects, this is uh, the, the persona that a lot of organizations feel uh, it, it relates to the sales professional. And if you're going to do really well in sales and you're going to execute your plan, um, you've got to do something different. So the whole webinar series focus is on sifting and sorting through all the things that you have control over and recognizing that there's lots of things like COVID-19, uh, competition, uh, you, your buyers, uh, company policies and budgets. There's a lot of things you don't have control over. But what you do have control over is what are you offering? What's your message? And how are you behaving? Because if you look up at the used car salesperson, all they have to trade on is their behavior because their product and all the aspects of the product are identical. 
So the salespeople that do really, really well in these environments are incredible behavioral uh, scientists. They just know how to deal with people. So let's move on to why selling is so hard and how sales planning um, you know, becomes uh, such a, uh, it's almost like an Excel exercise if you don't recognize this. Many entrepreneurs and sales professionals as well have this undying obsession with talking about what it is they have, the what, the features, the advantages, the benefits, why it's better than the competition. It's just ad nauseum about all of the upside of products, services, and features. There's nothing wrong with understanding your product, services, features, and advantages, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, about a different angle as we go on. Very few entrepreneurs and sales professionals even that I work with have spent the time to really dig into how does buying and selling actually occur? How do you take a sales plan, develop it with all of those nice hockey stick curves for your sales growth that everybody has in every plan I've ever seen, everybody's gonna be you know, Microsoft in five years. How do you actually make that happen? You're not gonna do it by shoveling features and advantages and benefits down buyer's throats because it just simply doesn't work and that's not how people buy. So let's look at the difference between ourselves as sellers <coughs> and buyers, and this is at a very high level. First, sellers are optimistic, and they look for reward. We, we love the upside. We value relationships, and <clears throat> we love change. I mean, you, you're not an entrepreneur because you're, uh, you're, you're wanting to have just a quiet, understated, conservative lifestyle. This, there's a lot of stress that goes along with being an entrepreneur. We also uh, believe uh, our own facts, particularly if you've hired a salesperson, they rarely will uh, challenge you on your product capabilities or your service capabilities. And there's this, uh, a lot of sales training fo focuses on the features, advantages, and benefits. And we love to talk about it, show it, demonstrate it and uh, we, ju we just love that aspect because we're so proud of what it is that we've developed we look at the buyers they're naturally suspicious individuals and they're risk adverse they don't believe everything that we say they're always looking at well what's in it for me how does this affect me how does this benefit me and for the most part Buyers would just prefer to continue doing what they're doing today. Change isn't something that they welcome. And no matter how well we pitch whatever it is that we're selling, most buyers will want to validate that and double check it because of some of those stigmas that I was sharing with you earlier. And buyers will decide to move or not to move ahead on a product, not because of uh, features, not because of savings, but there's some emotional trigger that occurs there, which again, I will talk about when we get to the, uh, the session on risk mitigation and on how to pitch the product, particularly pitching it in a COVID-19 environment when emotions are running extremely high. But buyers also like to touch it, poke it, test it, try it all out. And that's why there's, this is, there's almost like this uh, common ground between buyers and sellers, where if I go in and I analyze what's happening with sales and why are sales not moving ahead, almost invariably I see they're all just talking about the product, but nobody's selling. And nobody's trying to make a connection with people to move it ahead. So in short, you know, we have a half full view of the world, buyer has a half empty uh, view of the world, and that means when we go into a meeting, we can have completely different dynamics on the agenda, whereas we want them to buy their agenda. Uh, the unspoken agenda is to make sure they get all the information that they can, but they don't want to commit to anything. Uh, we're going in with our motivating uh, factor being, whoa, this is an awesome sale. They're looking at it at the same time saying, I, phew, I don't have the budget for this. And then we have different pressures. If this is a really critical sale to make your payroll or to make your sales goals, uh, you know, that, that sets up a different behavior and a different way that you interact. And, and, and the buyer at the, at the same time is starting to look, they're starting to feel some anxiety and they're starting to back off saying there's some extra work for me. Anyone who thinks that the, the sale is related to the product is, is missing a very significant ingredient. So the habits of successful people, well, 
you must live through the, li the lens and the, uh, the experience of your customer. View your customer success as your own. What you do, what your company does, what your product does aren't important as compared to how will the customer benefit as a result of working with you. Active listening. We've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. We've got to listen twice as much as we speak. Personalize your message. I can't count the number of email blasts I've seen in the last 60 days that are just generic messages. No one's reaching out and talking to me at my level. It's something that might matter to me personally. And people skills. People buy from people. People don't buy products. People buy from people. Good salespeople always follow up. They always ask for referrals. They always are on the hunt. I've seen, uh, if, I don't know if you've ever sat on an airplane, we're not gonna be doing that re in the next little while, but I've, I've made lots of good uh, connections in airplanes. I'm constantly looking for business. I prepare, prepare, prepare. I rarely, if ever, wing anything. And I also know that if you wanna make more sales, if you want to hit your sales plan, know when to walk away from uh, opportunities that aren't going to materialize and utilize a good repeatable sales process. One of my uh, uh, heroes from the past, because I used to box as a kid, I, you know, f fabulous boxer, but in his mind, the, the fight was either won or lost uh, in the training. And, you know, sales planning and sales preparation is, is exactly this. Before you get into a live sales call, plan, plan, plan. Have a set of defined sales stages and, and uh, activities. Know how you're gonna progress an opportunity from one level to the next, and that's the next uh, uh, webinar that we're going to go into. Um, know who it is that you're talking to, how, how are you going to engage with them that makes them interested, and how are you going to make sure that you know that they're in lockstep with you, that you're not just talking about your product and thinking that they're getting it when in fact they're not. And then there's a whole series uh, and scope doesn't allow us to get into the job aids and uh, enabling technologies. And I'm sure you've all seen some variation of the funnel. This is, this is just pick one. To me, you know, whatever uh, sales process you use, and we'll talk a little bit about those uh, later on, um, you can just pick one. This is like being a couch potato and deciding, do I use an elliptical? Do I use a treadmill? Like, just pick one and go. But you need to be able to start tracking and measuring your, your, your progress. And here's a formula I'll lay out just, uh, you know, as a, um, an effectiveness formula, A times Q divided by T divided by T. And a is activity times quality interaction divided by the time and divided by distraction. If you want to take your sales plan out of the upper uh, stratosphere and bring it down to earth, you constantly look for ways to adjust these percentages. Right now, statistically, based on thousands and thousands of um, surveys, only one third of the entire sales effort is actually spent in selling. Two thirds of it is spent looking for people to sell to, figuring out how to sell to them, coming up with ways to talk to them, and maybe, of course, travel now, well, <laughs> the good news, I guess, for COVID-19 is you can convert that travel time into selling time. So key takeaways. What's an effective sales plan? Listen, you can do this on a spreadsheet. Easy, easy. Just make sure that you don't lose anything in the translation between your high-level business plan and, and your uh, sales plan in terms of the, the numbers in terms of the, uh, the partners that you're going after, the target markets. And this is what sets the goal posts out for your sales team. And if you're a one man uh, or one person operation, uh, you're it, you're the sales team. Uh, if you've got a team, then you need to set some guidelines. And the most 
critical element in breaking down your marketing plan into a sales plan is make it goals driven, have a series of meaningful uh, key performance indicators that will measure effectively your process as you go along. So let's, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you, William, and um, your audio is off, I think, William. Yes, yes, I was. Uh, thank you, Steve. So um, I was sending just a quick reminder uh, here. If you have any questions, uh, we have a Q&A uh, option here at the bottom of the screen for you to ask your questions. Uh, you can ask anonymously or you can ask, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, to everyone. And, uh, and I will read the question out loud to Steve. Um, maybe let's give a minute or two. We don't have any questions right now. If, we, if there are no questions, uh, then Steve will continue and we'll move on to uh, the second topic uh, of, the, uh, of today's webinar, which is sales qualification. Okay, so we have an anonymous question, um, and it goes like this. This might be uh, coming up, but how can people still sell when their product might not be COVID-friendly, and it might feel uncomfortable? Any recommendations? Well, um, I'm going to assume that not being COVID-friendly um, it's related to a product or service that is not uh, connected to an essential business. I'm not sure if that's the case or not, but um, let's just assume that whatever is you're selling is not connected or is connected to a business that's been declared as non-essential. Um, there's nothing to say that you can't continue to sell and continue to tee those opportunities up and to have meaningful conversations with them because we will turn on the economic recovery engines again and if you wait uh, you might find that someone else is going to backdraft and and take that opportunity so i would recommend if if, if that is the nature of the question and it is uh, you know my, my products not um appropriate to sell right now because of the lockdown um it's still appropriate to reach out to them, talk to them. And uh, in fact, the conversation script that I typically recommend is don't tell them about your product. Just say, are you open to discussing how we could possibly work together when all of this madness ends? You know, just have a collaborative conversation with them and put yourself in there at the head of the queue for when it does become more appropriate to, to uh, you know, sell and market your product or service. Let me know if that addresses, if that was the nature of your question. I'm just kind of guessing uh, based on, on the, uh, the question itself. Yeah, and that's true and that's fair. I mean, if you, if you like whoever asked that question, if you'd like to uh, maybe clarify or maybe add to that question, um, now, is it, now is a good time. We'll still have a few minutes. Okay, I see. Okay, that was great, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so it seems there are no more questions. Um, we could get started with the second topic. Uh, sure. Happy to do that if you want to. And, and, and sorry to interrupt, so I was gonna say if, so because we're, we're moving on to the second topic, I guess if you're open, Steve, then if anyone comes up with a question between now, you know, pretending the first part of the of the webinar, between now and the next ten minutes, right? Or you're thinking about how to ask that question and you're not ready, um, uh, are you open to uh, addressing any questions um, later on uh, during the, the Q and A? Okay, Absolutely. perfect. I've got one objective here, and that is to do as much as I can in this short time period to help uh, your your, uh, your members and your attendees uh, with with thriving in this somewhat challenging time thank you yes yes uh likewise um okay so then uh so then let's continue excellent all right i'll wait for a screen share and then i'll get back at it 
Okay. Uh, there you go. All right, sales qualification. Now this is um, actually, it, it somewhat ties to the question that was in the Q&A as well, which is at what point do you uh, decide to sell and what time uh, do you decide to run? I thought this might be appropriate considering the Yukon Gold Theory thing. You know, I, I watch that all the time. You know, anybody can lay an egg in a, in a sales plan. That we're looking for the, the golden egg here. Where, where are the opportunities? There's lots of things that you can chase. And uh, if you want to make your sales plan a reality, you have to increase your skills in being able to first find the right of targets to go after. And then secondly, no, even though they're, they seem to be a good target, at what point do you walk away? So that's what we're going to walk through this time. Again, I'll start with some comments about, you know, how does COVID-19 impact the typical sales process uh, related to qualifying the opportunity? Why is it important to continue to qualify throughout the selling cycle? How do you actually qualify prospective customers? And I'm going to share with you some of the, uh, the most common qualification frameworks out there. And I'll walk you through an example of one which can be easily modified to match whatever product or service that you're selling. And so let's start with, again, the COVID-19 impact. This is a, uh, a concept that's referred to as the tiger in the tent. Right? So all of a sudden, COVID-19 just upsets the apple cart. And the way that your prospective customers, even, even companies that you were chasing and maybe you were having good sales conversations with before, when the crisis hits, response is usually one of four uh, uh, approaches here. Either you've got companies that are just said, that's it, I don't care, COVID-19 or not, I'm coming out and swinging. This is called uh, you know, the, the fight or flight uh, syndrome. Then you've got organizations where you may call them and you'll say, hey, look, we were really getting along well in this uh, conversation before COVID-19. And, and, and you'll hear terms like, oh, well, we're hunkering down. I can't count the number of times I've heard that term. We're hunkering down. So everybody's taking their P&L and they're slicing every single expense line. And they're just, they're just uh, uh, running for cover. And then there's organizations that just simply don't have a plan. They're just trying to continue uh, and, 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 and hope is their strategy. And then there's a fourth one, which is the, the denial or the fawn process, which is, uh, you know, you're going to try valiantly to uh, convince yourself that this is actually not going to impact your business, right? That's the denial. And anybody that you're selling to is going to have one or all of these as part of their mix. Depends on their, uh, their organization, depends on their, their culture. So if we look at before COVID-19, now, one of the things I always suggest to people is a high level acid test as to whether or not you're selling to people who are going to buy is figure out is what, is, what, what they're trying to do. Is this an irritation to them? Is it a problem or is it something really critical? Because an irritation might kick off a little bit of a research project. A problem might kick off. Maybe they're going to look at a few things. But usually, unless it's a critical issue, they're not going to take action. So that was before COVID-19. Now let's look at it. My suggestion is, if you had a lot of uh, opportunities that you were trying to sell and close, look at them again through the same lens of critical problem irritation and realize that uh, for most organizations, if, if you hear them talking about oh, geez, we're just hunkering down. Unless this was a hair and fire problem, you know, I would just drop them from my sales uh, conversations right now. I would, I would eliminate anybody who I determined would, was a problem or an irritation and, and focus only on the people who had a critical problem. The challenge, however, is that this whole uh, pyramid could be turned up on its head too, because the people that you might have been selling to before who had a critical business issue were in a target market that is now considered non-essential. 
And so all of a sudden they're off the, off the uh, table. But there might be someone who before was just looking at whatever you had to sell them as my mildly interested. And now all of a sudden it's become quite critical. I've got uh, several clients that I've got living examples of this where, you know, I have a client who has um, technology that, that sells into the um, uh, video a conferencing world, guess what? That's a pretty good run right now. But they're not, uh, uh, they, previous to that, they, the uh, telemedicine and telehealth organizations were just kicking the tires up. So, sales qualification, what's it all about? Well, here's the simple thing. Here's a simple definition. It's just to make sure you're not chasing something you can't close. Is this piece of business worth pursuing? Is the customer likely to do anything at all? Can you win it? Because even if they're, uh, if they're going to select somebody, if you're up against a competitor that's five times your strength, you know, maybe, maybe it's time to uh, you know, cut your losses. And every sale that you go into that you can't win sucks energy out of the organization, sucks energy out of the sales team. And I keep telling uh, sales uh, professionals, particularly young uh, startup sales individuals, if you want to make more money, you want to close more sales, stop wasting your time. It's the one resource you can never get back. Lots of sales methodologies out there, and I'm not here to debate the pluses or minus of them. There's, there's, and a methodology is more like a belief structure. There's conceptual selling, challenger, the Sandler, customer-centric solution selling. Just pick one. And I, I won't suggest one over the other. And there's a wide range of um, sales frameworks, which I'm gonna share with you in a bit. But before you make a selection, before you start building out your sales qualification framework, let's just look at some of the fundamentals behind any of those methodologies. First, if you can't uncover a reasonable pain or an acute pain, there's not likely going to be the impetus to make a sale because people don't volunteer for change and they don't volunteer for doing extra work. So unless it's a business issue or it's uh, something of personal value to them, it's, it's a tough uphill climb. If you can't create a, an emotional attachment, and I'm gonna spend much more time on this in the subsequent session, if you can't get them to care about it, well, it's not going to happen either. So you can have a perfect product, perfect fit, no buyer. I use this as an example. Uh, I owned a health club and I could have somebody walk in who was 40 or 50 pounds overweight, high blood pressure, and I could tell them in absolute detail how I could help them. But if they weren't motivated, they just turned around thanked me for my time and out they went. No desire, no buyer. Stop talking about your product. Diagnose before you prescribe. Ask people questions. This is an entire um, methodology behind this. And, and again, scope doesn't allow us to get into that in detail. If you're selling something that requires more than one person to get involved, and especially if you're selling to something that requires a manager to uh, approve something, um, you have to figure out what does each of those individuals get out of this at their level. Pain flows throughout in the whole organization. And a solution, the solution, you know, I've, I've often told, particularly for software companies, I like to refer to their stuff as solutions. I say the only person who can say something is a solution is the customer. You have software. They decide if it's a solution. It's that simple, and you have to try to bridge the gap. There's a huge um, element of the person-to-person -person factor in selling, um, an enormous amount of it. And a lot of salespeople right now are struggling, especially salespeople who were in-person salespeople that were used to going out and doing the one-to-ones and doing the, the meetings and the lunches and, and the golf dates and all those. They are suffering substantially from uh, having to do remote selling. Even though they've got visual like we have with Zoom, it's a lot different than being there in person. 
Power buys from power is another principle that is, again, these are all inherent in any of these sales qualification frameworks or books that you'll read out there. You have to get in front of the power person. You have to get in front of the person that makes the decision. And when you do, you have to demonstrate that you're in a position of authority as well so that you can get this deal done and stop wasting time. If you're in a competitive situation, we can't bash the competition. We have to first say, well, like Cisco, we also do this. Or like this service, we also do that. However, how do you see yourself doing this? Because that was something that you shared with me that you weren't able to accomplish. And so you, you make yourself equal, you don't bash the competition, and then you rise above it by basically uh, re-architecting their vision of what they need in order to solve their problem. And here's the big one, man, oh man, oh man. If you want to make your sales numbers, whether you be a salesperson or whether you be the CEO or the entrepreneur or whatever, if you want to make your numbers, stop selling to people who can't buy. That's not to mean that they, they don't have a role in the process, but you have to get to someone who can authorize the sale as quickly and as efficiently as you can. And that's what all of these frameworks are uh, that I'm gonna share with you. So there's a whole series of frameworks out there. And I tell you, it is alphabet soup. And uh, you know, if you're having trouble with um, uh, sleeping at night and you want uh, a cure, I highly recommend going out and buying all these books. You can, you can read them ad nauseum. One of the most common ones and longest term out there is called the BANT formula, the budget, authority, need, and timeline. And I'm gonna start rolling these out. And what I think you're going to see is there's a, there's a pattern. Every one of these uh, um, authors has tried to put their own spin on what, in my mind, is a pretty common theme. The Anum approach, authority, need, urgency, and money, which you can see is almost identical to BANT, except this particular methodology puts much more emphasis on get to the decision maker early. Whereas BANT is all about, I'm not going to sell them unless they tell me they have a budget. Which, by the way, um, again, if I were in a live class, I'd be asking, uh, how many people do you think actually budget for what it is that you have available? Nobody budgets anymore. Um, and if they do, uh, that doesn't automatically mean they're going to spend it. So I, I find sometimes the budget question can be a little bit misleading. Spin is another very, very uh, popular one, which is uh, situation, problem, implication, and need, or payoff. Um, which again is a, a, a variation on the BAMP theme, um, but they're placing more emphasis on understanding what it is that your prospective customer is trying to accomplish. Medic is a monstrous one if you're selling really complex high-end things uh, where you have to map out all of the um, various political um, power trees and uh, how they make decision and finding internal champions. But they all again say, uh, share a same common thread. CHAMP is another common one out there, stands for challenges, authority, money, and prioritization. Again, do you have a problem? Is it an urgent problem? Are you prepared to spend money in order to get that problem looked after? And oh, by the way, can you do it or do I have to find somebody else who can? That's really, if, if you read under the covers of all these, that's really what they're going after. And here's a monstrous acronym. I mean, I don't even know if that counts. That's almost like its own language. Um, this is the one uh, HubSpot actually developed this one. Goals, plans, challenges, timeline, budget, authority, blah, blah, blah. What does all of that mean? Well, I'm going to walk you through it. And this is the final one here, SNAP, which is simple. And I'm all for simple. Um, simple, but it has to be thorough and it has to be effective. And NEAT, uh, needs, economic impact, authority, and timeline. So any one of those just to me, again, it's like going to the gym and you're, you're out of shape and you're trying to debate which piece of uh, cardio equipment you should start on. Just get on one and start spinning. You know, it's a lot better than just sitting there and thinking about it. So I'm going to share with you an example. I, I, uh, a colleague uh, out of the UK, um, uh, because it actually has nothing to do with any of these, and I like it because of that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this a simple example. I'm gonna just walk you through this. And this is something you can easily adapt and either increase or shrink 
to match whatever it is your selling environment uh, uh, contains. It starts with a real simple assessment framework for saying, under each of these factors, do, is what I know about the business, uh, this, this opportunity, is it, am I in an ideal situation? Is it acceptable? Is it kind of on the borderline? Or is it, I, I simply don't know. And I'll show you, I'll walk you through this. And again, you can, uh, you can utilize this. And you can rebuild this in an Excel spreadsheet easily. It starts in two phases. First, when I'm initially start trying to make an inroad into an opportunity, what are the key gating questions and the key gating criteria that I should be uh, looking for? And it starts with, uh, you know, a business issue, uh, a reason to act, organizational fit. Um, who am I talking to? Do they have funds? And is there an urgency? And again, you'll see a similarity in these terms to all the other academic uh, frameworks that I shared with you before. So let's just walk through a, a simple example of that. On the factor of business issue, you just ask the question, is this critical based on what you know? Is it important? Yeah, it's, it's important, but maybe it's not the top of mind. Is it just something that's frustrating to them or have you not yet uncovered it yet? And just bear with me and I'll show you how you can use this as you go along. Do they have a reason to act? Is there something really compelling that they've shared with you in your conversation that says, you know, we can't live with this pain. We have to fix this. We must do this. And, or is it, yeah, it's strong, but again, uh, not top of mind. Or is it, hey, look, yeah, sure, it's an issue, but it's you know, something we've been living with for years. And you know, unless you tell me something really out outstanding, I'm probably not gonna do anything. Or again, the unknown. And we look at it in terms of the organization. Do they match with what my marketing plan says is my ideal customer profile? Do they have the right attributes? Or are they on the peripheral, um, you know, but, but still a pretty decent opportunity? Or are they risky? Like they're, they're just loosely connected to what I think is a really good customer. And again, the unknown. Who am I talking to? Are they a decision maker? If so, fantastic. Or are they somebody that can influence the decision maker? Uh, that's a that's a second best and uh, are they on the outside they're just one of the the many people that might have to get involved source of funds have we confirmed that if we convince them we are the right way forward that they would actually have money to do it or is it they've said look if we have to we could find the money it's probable or is it highly suspect because they're all in a, a lockdown situation with their their funds and how urgent is this? You know, the fact that you've got a problem doesn't mean you're ready to solve it instantly. So you need to start asking these questions. And by the way, what's implied by all of these is you have to have questions that probe for each of these. And these questions have to be very well constructed. And very simply, you could just apply a simple ranking mechanism to this to say, where am I in terms of scorecarding this initial qualification criteria. So I can take all the opportunities in my pipeline. And if because of COVID-19, you haven't revisited all the opportunities and re-ranked them using some kind of a, an objective framework, I would highly recommend you do that because who was hot before may be not hot today and vice versa. Somebody that might've been on their, uh, the fringe may now be one of your best prospects. But again, take the emotion out of it, take opinions out of it and make it as um, uh, logical as you can. If they pass the first round of sniff tests, then you can go into the next uh, level of detail and you know start to shape the tactics for bringing this piece of business in by making sure that you're the right fit, making sure you're talking to the right people, and you understand how they're going to actually come up with the funding, who are you competing with, and on relative priority, a lot of a lot of salespeople uh, die in the sword of not uh, checking out um, the fact that I've got a five times ROI. Um, may not matter if there's three other projects that they're chasing that have 10 times ROI. So again, we go through the same ideal, acceptable, risky, and unknown for each of these criteria to say, do we have a, um, uh, a fully qualified opportunity? Does it meet with all of the criteria that we believe are important? And uh, you know, is, is there a, a, an opportunity here to do business? And uh, do we understand how they're going to buy? Do we understand who's involved? And 
these English, you know, kind of straight up, this, this avoids a lot of the interpretation that happens in a lot of sales pipelines that I look at nowadays. We believe we're uniquely positioned or we're up against competition. I think we're doing well or geez, we're up against two big players here. We have to figure out a strategy. Otherwise, even if we convince them of the business case, we might lose to the competition. And then where does this stack up in terms of the relative priority? Once again, easy to scorecard this and just apply it. And I'm only bringing this out as an example. There are dozens of uh, scorecards that can be applied. Uh, the point is to not assess your opportunities based on opinion because we are optimists and our opinion is always it was a great sales call. And the facts may not be that it was a great sales call in the mind of the buyer because of this uh, glass half full, glass half empty uh, that I shared with you earlier. Here's another simple way to take various aspects of your um, qualification process and uh, put them into a simple radar chart. I've got lots of clients that do this where they, they identify what an ideal profile looks like in terms of having um, you know, the best opportunities. And then they map their actual opportunities in a radar chart and they look for the gaps. It's a very, very easy visual way to look at it so that you're not going down the rabbit hole. And the key takeaways for using these frameworks is, is simply this. You want to make fact-based judgments about whether this is a good piece of business, not opinion-based. It's great to put in subjective, qualitative aspects, no question. Gut call is great, but you need as many facts as you can to effectively sort through whether these are good opportunities to chase or not. And the reason is quite straightforward. If you're wasting your time on deals you can't close, uh, people you, that can't buy, you're not gonna hit your targets, or even if you hit your targets, gee, what if, you, what if you'd have done all the right things? Maybe you could have doubled up. Right? You, there's never enough sales. I've never talked to a CEO or an entrepreneur yet who has said, look, stop, stop. I've got way too many sales. I'm done. Like I, I need to figure out something else. I, I'm sick of having too many sales. I've never heard that yet. So no matter how many sales you get, go get some more and stop wasting your time and resources on chasing the long shots. All right, so I'll go back again to um, the Q&A format with you, William. Thank you, uh, Steve. We, uh, we did get a question um, uh, right after we, we got started. Um, I will read this question, uh, but in the meantime, I'll uh, open the floor to more questions. And I have one of my own as well after this one. If, uh, um, so the question is, uh, are there free supports to learn how to make a website sell products online? Free support for how to build a website in order to sell online? How to make a website? Yeah, how to make a website, how to build a website and, and, um, and sell products online, yes. Yeah, the, uh, resources for doing that, you could certainly, I mean, there's, there's lots of, um, um, platform providers that, you know, have their, uh, their freeware version of their website builders, you know, with their e-com platforms and their stores, and they usually have tips and tricks and things that go along with doing that. Of course, they're wanting to, you know, their whole thing is to get you hooked, right? And, and to bring you in like the GoDaddy's and, uh, you know, those kinds of platform builders, uh, CityMax, there's, there's a whole host of them out there, which, are free initially, uh, but you get what you pay for. <laughs> you, you, you get, you get you know, the basics that you can throw up there. And I gotta tell you, the website itself isn't important. It's the pitch. And uh, you know, I've seen really effective websites that are really visually ugly because they're just text because somebody didn't have the money to have a big well, fancy website put up. Um, but the content and the message was so compelling that people immediately saw the call to action and went to the shopping cart. 
So I wouldn't focus too much on the website design as I would on what's the message. But there's right. definitely freebies out there. I, so um, thank you. And if, um, if you, so whoever asked that question anonymously, if you have any other question or would like to add to that question, please, um, please uh, do so. Uh, I, so my question is, um, I wonder if COVID-19 um, extended by default the sales, the sales cycle of products that even are selling well, is that sales cycle being extended? Uh, what to watch for if you see that happening? And as, again, also by default, that means that the lifetime value of your customer is being shortened. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, it, that's a depends question, right? Uh, but in a general sense, if the organizational approach to the crisis is the flight and the freeze, then the sales cycle is going to extend. If they're in a fight mode and you can quickly convince them that you can help them fight their way through, the sales cycle will contract and it'll decrease. And the one thing I'm noticing uh, from people who are on inside sales calls, just banging the phones, trying to get first appointments, before they were being ignored almost wholeheartedly. Now they're getting appointments, especially if they've got a message that says, why us, why now? So if, you're, if your offering isn't directly beneficial to helping them navigate this challenging time, you're going to see a delay. They're going to put you into the uh, into the optional bin uh, because right now it's it's going to be very very uh, mission critical stuff that gets the quick approval. Uh, but on the flip side, as I say, I've, I've seen uh, sales cycles that were you know opportunities that were six or eight months already in the sales cycle just all of a sudden they closed because they said eh, this is no longer optional. We have to have this. So it depends on your market. Depends on the industries you're selling to. And this again, why you have to go back to your market segmentation and, and just assume all of those things need to be reevaluated because there might be a, a hidden gem of a market or a sub-segment of a market that where all of a sudden you now become that uh, cup of water for somebody's hair is on fire. No offense, when, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, um, uh, I do have a, uh, in addition to that question, a second question, which is, well, if um, it is, so it is it, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, came up with this question before of, should I, uh, should I offer a free service? If I don't have a free service, should I maybe just start offering that as a, uh, in making myself available that way? Should I, uh, should I lower my prices? Uh, and in addition to that, and, and that be, and so that, that will be my addition to that question is, uh, should I, if I'm not offering, uh, install, so installment payments, um, and maybe start in doing that. Uh, and when is, and if I haven't, you know, we have, a, if I, if I'm not offering that yet, what are the things to watch for? Uh, because if you're not, if that's not a way that you're accustomed to, uh, to, um, uh, to selling, uh, then, uh, you know, what are things to watch for before making those changes that might actually change substantially the way things uh, flow at the sales level? Yeah, and that, I, I must say, when, you know, March the 12th, which is a date that sticks in my mind, because I was actually on a cruise, uh, on a princess cruise ship, no less, when, uh, you know, the lockdown was announced, and I'm out at sea, and I'm thinking, oh, my, you know, the world's just come to an end. And I was getting emails from my clients uh, with similar kind of things, which is, you know, should I, uh, should I stop selling? Should I start laying off my salespeople? So there was this, uh, this almost like a panic stricken approach. And, and also this, um, you know, I don't want to really sell now. It doesn't feel right. It's almost like immoral to be selling. It's almost like, you know, maybe, maybe I should just be, you know, um, looking at it as the benefiting mankind and giving my stuff away and all that, you know, and I'm saying, Hey, look, there's nothing wrong with uh, charitable views of the world, but if you've got something that's of value to people, 
and they see the value in it, people are paying for it. You know, if, if, if they're in business and uh, you're part of them, you know, continuing to be in business and even to thrive, um, sure, they're going to pay for it. It doesn't mean that you don't find another opportunity to, um, you know, defray expenses, uh, maybe go into, you know, a different terms for payment and stuff. But for the most part, no. If your stuff's of value, you charge for it, you collect. And because, you know, <clears throat> the economy needs it, right? I mean, not, not to be philosophical, but man, if, if everybody's giving their stuff away, where's the economy going to go? We have to make money. We have to survive. We have to uh, preserve our uh, employees. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, not, I don't have an employee base because I'm an independent, but I've run organizations with employees and, you know, I, I was always opposed to discounting um, under any circumstances because it said I don't value my own offering. And it also jeopardized uh, the financial security of my company, which then jeopardized the uh, security of my employees. And that to me wasn't uh, negotiable. Thank you. And that's a fantastic because I think, I think sometimes um, uh, customers or rather entrepreneurs want to help and they realize that this is a problem that we are, obviously we all do our bit as individuals and as business owners, but also as a collective, as a wider, you know, as the wider Canadian collective of entrepreneurs and individuals, we do our part every time we, we purchase to make, you know, purchase decisions and, and, uh, and you want to contribute and you want to offer products for free or services for free or extend free trials or, uh, but it is important to realize that you, you know, you have commitments to your employees, commitments um, uh, to, uh, to, to your suppliers. And, uh, and it's important that you stay in business and that you remember yeah. if there is value to your product or your service that you get paid for it. Uh, right. And, and as we'll talk about when we get to the pitch aspect of it, one of the things I'm highly recommending you do is think through uh, your sale to your customer, and particularly for B2B companies. You know, we think about, well, how do I sell to this, this other business? Uh, think about how can you help them sell to their customers, right? If they're the ones selling to an end consumer, if you've got a product, let's say you're selling to a dealer who then sells to a consumer or a retailer who sells, help them help their customers. Now you become incredibly valued, valuable to them. And the knock-on effect of the economic lift uh, becomes you know, not just you, it becomes you're helping your customer and then you're helping your customer's customer. And, and I, I, I always say, even if I'm talking to a prospective customer, this actually goes right back to the first question. Even if I'm talking to a customer who was a prospect before, but now they're in a non-essential business, I want to talk to them on the basis of, um, let's talk about when this lifts, how we can work together. And even if I don't make a sale, uh, this is a worthwhile conversation for us to be having. And we become much more collaborative. And I tell people, be a human first, salesperson second. And, and, and get in there. And, and uh, what, what you have to do now, I think more so than before, is really understand your customer. I mean, at a level that you perhaps didn't before. Because it's their customer that they've got on their mind. So how are you going to help them with that? And then they'll pay for it. Absolutely agree. Um, I uh, thank you, Steve. I don't, do not see any other uh, question. Um, and uh, I think uh, with no further questions, then maybe we can wrap up just a little sooner. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. I uh, would like to remind everyone that there is a part two uh, coming up. Uh, to this webinar um, uh, on June 24th at noon again, uh, sales part two, risk mitigation and sales pitch. Um, so join us then. And, uh, and until then, uh, thank you, Steve. And thank I look you. forward to the next one. Thank you very much, everyone. Please stay healthy. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.